So good morning. You can tell by the uh, agenda that uh, I am Renata Kendry. I'm the director of the uh, Adani Institute in the Central East Addiction Technology Transfer Center. And I want to, and we want to, welcome you to our first conference on tobacco and behavioral health and extend our thanks to all of you for choosing to be here and spending the next day and a half with us. Um, we think that this issue is really, really important, and we hope that by your attendance, you believe it is important as well. Um, so as I said, we're pleased to have you engage with us as we share ideas and perspectives um, over the next day and a half on how the health system and Notice that I didn't say the health care system, but the health system, um, working collaboratively, can begin to reduce the uh, tobacco use among individuals with behavioral health conditions. Focusing on integration, interventions, insurance coverage, we'll have an opportunity to hear from and exchange ideas with, and I think that's really important, we'll talk about that a little bit later, with national leaders, public health experts, policymakers, researchers, and behavioral health prevention and treatment experts on current cessation activities. I think if you take a look at your agenda, a review of that will reveal a real powerhouse of presenters at this conference. On behalf of the Central East ATTC and the Dining Institute, I would like to personally thank each one of our extraordinary speakers uh, and presenters for being willing to share their time and their expertise with us. I had several people call me up and say, oh, Renata, this conference looks really good. You've got some great speakers. Um, is registration still open in Texas? So uh, know uh, those of you in the audience who have been exposed to the best that this field has to offer as a mix of these topics. So again, I encourage you to share your thoughts um, our second speaker today said, Ooh, where you really get the good information is from the individuals in the audience. So I encourage you to share your thoughts, your ideas, your questions with them. And we've set aside time after each presentation for you to ask questions, give them ideas, uh, so we can have this interactive dialogue. Someone said to me, when we started this, why are you doing this? And um, the, the reason we're doing this is, while we've made really great progress in the last 50 years uh, in reducing smoking, you'll see the surgeon, uh, synopsis of the Surgeon General's report uh, for you out there. Um, adult smoking has, uh, rates have fallen from 43% 50 years ago to 18% uh, generally. But cigarette smoking remains the chief preventable killer in America, with more than 40 million Americans caught in the web of tobacco dependence. When we stop and take a look at who are among those 40 million, we find that individuals with behavioral health conditions are nicotine dependent at a rate of two to three times higher than the general population, consuming over 40% of all cigarettes smoked in the United States. So if you step back and think about it, individuals with behavioral health conditions smoke at the rates of 50 years ago. Now all of us in here would say, we want health and wellness, we're excited about the Affordable Care Act and coverage because we want our folks to be healthy and well. Well, if we don't address their tobacco use, health and wellness will elude the population that we care so dearly about. I see several of you have been in the field for a long, long time, um, myself included. So we're serious about health and wellness for that population. We really, really do have to get this uh, cessation really rolling. So I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank our planning committee. We worked really hard. They gave us good guidance, lots of support. I'd like to acknowledge our SAMHSA Regional Administrator, Jean Bennett, who is with us today. Um, our SAMHSA Project Officer, Susan Swan, sends her apologies uh, at the last minute she's not able to come. But I also would like to acknowledge a very special um, organization who has given us tremendous support uh, for our efforts, and that's the Smoking Sensation Leadership Center, and you're going to hear from them 
the director of that organization uh, later on this morning. So I've been told to um, remind you of some of the housekeeping things that I need to remind you about. You've seen as you come in, lots of resources out there are on the tables. Um, evaluations in an attempt to do our part in going green. Uh, evaluations will be sent to you via email. It's all explained in your conference uh, program. We are really, really looking for your feedback as you fill out those evaluations to tell us what you liked, what we could do better. As we look to the future and make decisions about whether this is an important event that we need to hold again and again, uh, we want to make it the best it can be, so we really look forward uh, to your input. Um, CEUs, those of you who are looking for CEUs and getting CEUs, they'll be sent upon the receipt of your evaluations. Um, please make sure to get your verification stamp or your code uh, each time that you need to, and they can help you with that uh, out of the box. Lunch will be in this room. They're going to set up a buffet at 12 o'clock, and we will um, have our lunch in here And uh, as we have luncheon for our presentation. So with that, I am going to now, uh, with pleasure, introduce our opening plenary speakers, uh, Francis Harding and Dr. Stephen Schroeder. They will be giving us a perspective of the big picture and how their organizations are responding to this issue, and how they are each making a difference, both separately and as partners. Our first speaker, Fran Harding, serves as the Director of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration's Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, and is recognized as one of the nation's leading experts in the field of alcohol and drug policy. CSAC provides national leadership in the federal effort to prevent alcohol, tobacco, and drug problems. Uh, Director Harding serves as the lead for SAMHSA's strategic initiative on the prevention of substance abuse and mental illness, which creates communities where individuals, families, schools, faith-based organizations, and workplaces take action to promote emotional health, and reduce the likelihood of mental illness, substance abuse, including tobacco and suicide. Prior to federal service, Director Harding served as Associate Commissioner of the Division of Prevention and Recovery at the New York State Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services, where she was responsible for the development of policy and guidelines for alcohol, drug abuse, gambling, prevention, treatment, and recovery programs. Uh, she has held numerous national positions, uh, including serving as president of the NPN, the National Prevention Network, an organization representing the alcohol and drug abuse prevention offices in all 50 states. In, in 2004, she became the first non-researcher to receive the prestigious Science to Practice Award from the International Society of Prevention Research. And knowing researchers, man, that's a, that's a real, that's a real, real honor. And our second speaker, um, all the bios are quite extensive. Um, Dr. Stephen Schroeder is the Distinguished Professor of Health and Health Care Division of General Internal Medicine, Department of Medicine, University of California at San Francisco, where he also heads the Smoking Cessation Leadership Center. The center, funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the American Legacy Foundation, works with leaders of more than 50 American health professional organizations and healthcare institutions to increase the cessation rate for smokers. It has expanded the types of clinician groups that support cessation, developed an alternative ces cessation message, ask, advise, refer, created new ways to market toll-free telephone clip lines, and engaged the mental health community for the first time last year, Dr. Schroeder, probably 10 years ago, in a, uh, so he's been in this fight for, for a little while. Um, Dr. Schroeder graduated, he did lots of other things, but I'm going to abbreviate this because it is in your program. Dr. Schroeder graduated with honors from Stanford University and Harvard Medical School and trained in internal medicine at the Harvard Medical Service of Boston City Hospital. 
He has held faculty uh, appointments at Harvard, George Washington, and US UCSF. Um, he has been the founding medical director of the university sponsored HMO uh, at uh, US University of California, San Francisco, and founded the Division of General Internal Medicine. He's published extensively. He has six honorary degrees and numerous awards, and lives in Tiburon, California, with his wife Sally, a retired school teacher. So I would like to say welcome and thank you to our opening speakers, and Fran is going to kick uh, us off. Thank you, Renata. Um, what a pleasure this is. Uh, I bring you greetings from our administrator, Pam Hyde. Unfortunately, she couldn't come. Uh, she had uh, booked, actually, agreed to do this a while ago, and if you know anything about government, it has come up. And, it wasn't too long ago she got a, a major conflict and asked if I would come and I said to Renata, uh, you know, it wasn't a problem for me uh, because then I get to put on a little bit of my own spin with this, uh, which is prevention. Uh, you heard that I am the director of prevention for SAMHSA I'm, uh, every day uh, and it's truthfully every day when I walk into the office I am so very grateful to have that position and to work for this government particularly because of the progressive, fast-paced work that we're doing. And when, when topics that we thought that we had taken care of, that we thought we were ahead of the curve on, and really reducing tobacco use, particularly around our youth, and now all of a sudden things are changing, I'm glad I'm in the chair that I'm in to begin to help arrange some of the programming and the projections that we go with. Before I begin, I must uh, also highlight two other colleagues that are sitting in the audience from SAMHSA that, and the prevention unit that I work with. Um, Doug Tipperman, who many of you probably already know, has been doing this type of work uh, since I've known him. It hasn't been that long since I've known you, but um, I know you've been uh, working on this. And Judith Nellis, who works actually in our HIV unit, but in the Division of Community Development. Both of them come with uh, great experience, and if you have time to chat with them before you leave, I highly recommend it. And of course, you've already been introduced to our regional administrator. So as I mentioned, this is an incredibly exciting time in the prevention field. We are evolving and sharpening every day the work that we do. Um, the, for treatment, uh, we are looking and congratulate you on all of your smoking cessation efforts focused on integration, intervention, and the impact of the Affordable Care Act. It's what we're here for. There are opportunities for prevention and treatment to collaborate across the full continuum of services. Particularly, you'll hear how we begin to integrate more and more with general medicine or overall health. We are truly working together at the federal level to bring you the programs and the tools and hopefully the resources that you need. SAMHSA, as hopefully most of you know, we run on our strategic plan. We have eight strategic initiatives uh, for a little while longer. We're actually reducing that to six. So that's a story for another day. Um, but uh, strategic initiative number one um, is the prevention of substance abuse and mental health disorders. I have the honor of leading that initiative. I draw you to the blue box. I'll be doing this a lot. That's if you're you're not quite awake this morning. Those are the main things you want to look at. Um, you know, I, I live with people that are not morning people. I'm a morning person. I'm up at 4 a.m. every morning. My family thinks I'm a little bit off-center, but you know, I just learn not to talk to anybody when they get up until that. That's probably why my husband and I stay together. We have our spaces in seven corners. SAMHSA's uh, objective is to reduce tobacco use among young persons with mental and substance use disorder in the whole. But we're doing so much more. One of the programs that I think most of you know is our SINAR program. It helps to reduce tobacco use among youth as it is integrate tobacco prevention and cessation more prominently. Substance abuse prevention and treatment block grant application is our major tool right now. We'll talk about the SINAR program in a minute. But right now, what we have firsthand to us is our block grant dollars, which is the largest grant that our states have to help the communities begin to make the changes uh, on ground level. 
For instance, we are asking our states to move towards tobacco-free behavioral health facilities and grounds. We really need to begin to look at the behavioral health community as it relates. And behavioral health in this point on in this conversation means the study of substance abuse and mental health disorders. It's just easier to call it behavioral health. We're also, in our block grant application, asking our states to do more screenings and referrals to treatment, to look at the nicotine dependence of our clients, our, our consumers, our people with lived experience, and our people in recovery, on par with what we look at with mental health services and substance abuse disorder services. We're asking how our state and agencies regulatory, regular, regularly screen, I guess I would have to, didn't have enough coffee, um, um, screen our patients, our clients, our people with lived experience around uh, tobacco use. It's very important that we focus on the reduction and likelihood of mental illness, substance abuse, including tobacco and suicide all together. We can't just look at one spot or one problem. Just like in general medicine, you go to a doctor, the doctor very rarely will just focus on one issue. You have an allergy, you have uh, a sprained ankle, you have a, a little bit of a heart moment. They look at the whole body in person, correct? We're doing the same thing with behavioral health, and that's why we're coming together. We're not melding, we're not molding, we're not disappearing. What we're doing is learning how to collaborate and to bring the strength of our programming and our efforts into general medicine and complementary looking at both the physical health, the mental health, and then the addictions and disorders that we, some of us have. As you can see on this slide, from uh, the harm from tobacco is disproportionately affects people with mental health and and substance use disorders. That's the main message that SAMHSA is now bringing to the table. I again draw your attention to the blue box. Smoking tobacco causes more deaths among clients in substance abuse treatment than in alcohol or drug use that brings them to, the tr to treatment in the first place. Now that is not a myth, that is fact. And that's one of the reasons why SAMHSA is spending so much of our effort and our time helping our, our treatment facilities, our prevention providers, our communities and our states to focus on this. The picture is especially discouraging for adults with serious mental illness. Current smoking among adults without mental illness steadily has decreased to 21.4% in 2012. Yet current smoking among adults with serious mental illness has fallen and remains nearly twice as high as, as high as 39.9% uh, of, of uh, since 2012. SAMHSA, we're trying to help. We're one agency, but again, we are working with our partners and collaborating with CDC and several others. Um, uh, we are, are doing our part, as to say. Under the guidance of Doug Tipperman, who I've highlighted this morning, uh, we are, SAMHSA is hosting a, 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 a tobacco Quite sure how to say this stuff. A Tobacco Policy Academy on June 19th. Um, it, is, it is tobacco control and behavioral health and states are interested in addressing tobacco use with persons with mental health disorders. Our whole agenda will be on how do we do this integration? What can you do as a program um, to begin to bring um, the issues to life? CSAP, um, along with, so any other information you want to know about the uh, Policy Academy, um, in the interest of time, I don't want to elaborate and get into the weeds on some of these. Um, CSA is developing a special tobacco cessation training program um, to, to integrate with their opiate facilities. We, we know that's a perfect uh, area to, to get in, uh, into the development of. I mentioned collaboration was important to us. We can't do this job alone. We need everyone to work together with us. Smokers with behavioral health disorders are a major dis uh, disparity group when it comes to addressing tobacco use. Accounting for 40% of all cigarette use by adults in this country, this group is especially attention. Following the HHS strategy, we are pleased to work with these issues with our other federal agencies. Starting, in, starting back in January 2012, SAMHSA and the National Institute on Drug Abuse 
co-chaired HHS's working group on tobacco control and behavioral health. We want to raise the awareness and encourage activities at the federal level to change the culture around tobacco use and behavioral health issues. Work group members include the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Food and Drug Administration, National Cancer Institute, National Institute of Health Resources and Services Administration, and the National Institute on Mental Health. When I say we're collaborating on a federal level, we truly are sending similar and same messages and strengthening our message across the country on working together and focusing on similar issues. Smoking usually begins in childhood and early adulthood, as all of us know. This, this again, begins to point out the urgency for the need for prevention and integration with all levels of treatment and, and prevention efforts and education. Reducing easy access to tobacco products is the cornerstone of the tobacco control prevention efforts and a major focus on what we do with Sinar. Research shows us that after controlling for price change, media campaigns, and smoking restrictions, the odds for a ratio of daily smoking among 10th graders was reduced. Prevention is effective with young people. We are targeting young people in the prevention arena so that we can stop the flow. One of the things you'll, you'll hear about in a moment, our biggest concern right now is the reduction of the perceived risk of tobacco products. Our young adults and young people in middle school and high school are starting to feel that it's not really as dangerous as they were once told about smoking and the control. All enforcement programs that reduce the sales of tobacco to minors reduce smoking by youth, and this is, has been incredibly effective. On the prevention side, again, SAMHSA's administrator administers the SINAR program, as I have mentioned a couple of times. I always try to vary this because I always want to just talk about SINAR. And the reason why I want to talk about SINAR, I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret of mine. Uh, I was in a state, working for a state, when signer legislation first was put out to the states. I was one of the most vocal state representatives, and Renata will know this, um, who was so much against signer. I fought and fought and fought and fought against this, and obviously I lost. Well, isn't it a little bit ironic <laughs> that I stand here now and say this is the best prevention program that the government has ever brought to the states and our of our communities. The reason why in New York State we did not care for the SINAR amendment is we were not living in a world where we did a lot of heavy collaboration among our partners. In New York State, our Department of Health was responsible for the restriction of sales, yet the, sub the Department of Alcohol and Alcohol Abuse was responsible for losing block grant dollars when you didn't do your job. So it forced two federal steps, excuse me, state agencies to work together, and that was a very scary proposition back in the day. The nation has weighed in, weighed in average retail violation rate for 50 states, and the District of Columbia, of Columbia has plummeted since 1997, which is now 40.1%. We have done our job and more. That's why it is the most effective. Uh, prevention uh, program that SAMHSA uh, proudly uh, owns and funds. 2012 was the seventh year, the seventh consecutive year in which se the Secretary found that all states, all states were in compliance with tobacco uh, and the um, SINAR requirements. Most states continued to report violation rates in 2012. And 34 of our states have achieved retail viol violations rate below 10%. 20% is the, the law. And 34 of our states are in 10%. That's all volunteer. That's all doing their work of prevention across uh, with, their, uh, with their partners in several other agencies that they work with. Nine states have retail, retail violation rates below 5%. Can you imagine that? That is such a, that's such a great achievement, having, that means young people, who in that, those five states, or nine states, excuse me, have very little opportunity to purchase <coughs> cigarettes from their popular place, what happens to be um, gas stations and small 
uh, small grocery stores. And, and I'm very proud to say that in 2013, all U.S. jurisdictions have conducted sign-on inspections and actively enforced their youth access to laws. And if you know anything about the, our United States jurisdictions, it is very difficult for them to have such a broad environmental prevention strategy. While tobacco use among youth continues to fall, we face ongoing challenges that calls for staying focused on the full range of tobacco control activities. We cannot take our eye off this. The Sign Art Program has, con has contributed to the failing rates of youth smokers who reported retail sales as their use and source of tobacco products. According to youth, our youth risk behavior, we're doing a, a good job, but it's starting to slip. We're having states that cannot meet that 20%. Reduction. We're working very hard with them to keep that number up. In 2011, 14% of students under the age of 18 who were current smokers reported that they usually got their own cigarettes by them in stores, small stores or gas stations. Meanwhile, the percentage of students reporting current cigarette use fell by half from 36.4% in 1997 to 18.1% in 2012. So the, the 2013 results well, will soon be available and we're anticipating that they continue, there, there will be a continue uh, uh, of a, a smaller number. The sign our requirements have helped shape the culture and the change. This is a true example of how environmental prevention approaches, which many people do not understand and do not support the value and the strength of a community coming together with their states to change attitudes and behaviors through media, through education. And the, the issue that I think most the reason why we have the most trouble getting support for environmental prevention activities is because people still feel in our country that you can only put your money into one type of programming. Environmental prevention only works when it's combined with a continuum of services throughout the prevention continuum of looking at environmental and universal um, programs, selective programs, and then of course integrated programs, which are really your programs of intervention before treatment. The field of tobacco control and prevention has been moving ahead at a rapid pace. We are on a roll, aren't we? <laughs> we feel every day there's something more, something new that we can do. The Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, which became law in 2009, gives the Food and Drug Administration the authority to regulate, manufacture, distribute, and market tobacco products to protect America's health. The FDA created the Center for Tobacco Products, which Doug sits on for us, which controls the, and contacts with states, jurisdictions, and tribes to enforce federal youth access and advertising laws that were enacted as part of the Tobacco Control Act. SAMHSA and FDA coordinate this work through our SIGNAR program sponsored by SAMHSA. In the exciting results, FDA news of new authority, it has recently proposed an action to begin regulating electronic cigarettes, including prohibiting sales to persons under 18. I'm sure, I'm sure all of you have been reading the news about how electronic cigarettes, or e-cigarettes as most of us refer them to, are becoming quite the emerging issue. The arrival of e-cigarettes and growing acceptance of marijuana are part of the climate that makes tobacco use more favorable. The introduction of e-cigarettes has found an audience among our young people, so please be vigilant in looking for this. The percentage of high school students who reported ever using e-cigarettes more than doubled in from 4.7% in 2011 to 10% between 2011 and 2012. Now that may not seem like a lot. And I know sometimes we throw statistics out at you, but this is a trend that we are seeing combined with the perceived um, drop in risk behavior around tobacco use. E-cigarettes are contributing to that risk. Young people are likely to be drawn to the sweet flavors of e-cigarettes, um, market makers. Not much unlike when our alcohol industry began to share some of our very sugary, some of our very sweet, some of our very flavored 
alcohol. And then they advanced, didn't they? They went from alcohol pops to, to uh, wine spritzers, and if that wasn't enough, now we're into flavored vodkas, flavored are for the older adults of us. Um, the industry is very creative, as we know, and they will continue to market their, their products. Same, a very similar thing is happening to our, um, electron, our, our cigarettes and our smoking and our tobacco issues. E-cigarettes popularize the act of smoking, and this is where it again falls into the prevention realm. It becomes glamorous again to smoke. If you believe that they're safe, then it's okay for you to partake. We have several um, high school students that are experimenting with e-cigarettes because they feel, one more time, we've not quite lost that feel that it is good to smoke. The trend toward legalization of marijuana has been, has been joined by the falling perceptions of risk increasing youth. So think about it, what it's like to be a young person today. Uh, you're getting these messages of don't do this and don't do that, alcohol is bad, tobacco is bad, drugs are bad, um, several other things that I'm not here to mention are bad. And then you start to see all these other things and you know all of our young people are far more aware today on the, uh, of our social media, of what is occurring and what is out there. So when you see e-cigarettes, and they're sold as, as uh, products that are safe for you, and you see states change their legislation around marijuana use, you start to understand that this all falls in the realm of behavior. And we need to focus when we're working with our young people, especially on our environmental area, environmental programs and our universal prevention at the grassroots level, at the community level, and in the state, and supported by the federal level. We are focusing very heavily on perception of the risk. While tobacco use among youth continues to fall, risk perception has softened, and that is the reason for the message. Limited resources in the state level does make it a little difficult to maintain comprehensive youth uh, tobacco access prevention programs. We understand that. CSEP is working with states to limit minors' access to tobacco products. Sorry, just checking the time. We are making similar efforts to better integrate SINAR into other federal control and programs, as I mentioned. The challenge and the partnerships and the collaborations, we ask you to work with us so that we can help you work with you, bring you the tools bring you the programs, bring you the connections that you might need help with. I often say to our prevention colleagues that we can no longer sit behind and, and wait for someone to invite us to a conversation, to invite us to the table where funding is being discussed, to invite us to the table for overall health. It is time for the prevention community to stand up and to begin to knock on doors and to do exactly what we teach. Our, our communities to do, to invite yourself to the table. It might be a little quiet the first couple of times you do it, but I guarantee you, as you bring the information, the knowledge, the talent that you have in the prevention field to this um, focus on, on this problem, people will begin to listen. We're encouraging states to link their sign art efforts with the larger tobacco control areas in their state. We're also actively enforcing youth access laws in a consistent manner statewide. We're providing merchant and ed education to all retailers in a variety of formats. We're using coalition members to conduct non-enforcement compliance checks for tobacco. Retailers with compliant retailers are rewarded and not compliant retailers are warned and signs are placed on their, on their windows. Parents partnering with state and public health agencies to ensure that youth tobacco access strategies are part of the state's comprehensive tobacco control plan overall. And before, we're asking states to coordinate with agencies receiving the FDA state enforcement contract um, laws to be able to work together both at a state and a local level. Collaboration is the key. Everything I just read came from a state or a particular the largest set of opportunities for reducing tobacco use exists in SAMHSA's efforts to integrate behavioral health, including substance abuse prevention. With general medicine, namely primary care, such integration is a priority which involves engaging all your stakeholders, 
such as behavioral health care systems, providers, payers, health care training, institutions, and every other agency you can think of at the state and local level. Health reform does provide you an opportunity to include more screenings for tobacco, more cessation in your treatment programs through private insurance and Medicaid coverage. States have the vital role in defining the scope and the quality of the cessation programs that we will need. Now a little PR for my friends from FDA and CDC. Um, the advantage of, take advantage of all information and products that are out there to help you with your fight and your control at the state and local level. Um, all of SAMHSA's products are online, including take advantage of all the federal prevention resources that may help you to, to bring a part of your conversation and a broader scope and on the community and statewide. Statewide comprehensive, comprehensive tobacco control programs that are sustained over time have shown to work, and sometimes we forget to look at that. CDC's best practices for comprehensive tobacco control programs, released in 2014, is a guide based on the best available knowledge and science that can help states plan and establish um, comprehensive tobacco control programs and all. And as a part of the Secretary's call to make the next generation tobacco free, the FDA's Real Cost campaign targets 10 million young people ages 12 to 17 who have never smoked cigarettes but are thinking about it and are open to the idea. Youth who are already experimenting with cigarettes and are at risk for becoming regular smokers are also part of, of their target. This is just a couple of examples of our closest partners with tobacco control that we wanted you to be aware of. So in closing, I cannot address more um, that alcohol and illicit drug use without, uh, without looking at tobacco and the connection of tobacco use with other use and with our treatment and our recovery partners. We must begin to integrate. We must bring back that vigilant control that we had back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s around tobacco. We are at a different light, not the same light, of looking at the areas that we need to work with and control. And we have learned through SAMHSA and our efforts over the years with our federal partners that collaboration truly is the key to be get, to take a small message with a small budget and be able to spread it through, throughout your states and throughout your communities. SAMHSA would like to hear from you at all costs. What can we do more? What can we do better? What tools do you need that you don't see out there? Do you need more policy academies? Is there something that we can do in, and help you through pushing through legislation? Please let us know. We truly are here to help you through, to continue to sustain the success we've had in this country of all the smoke-free areas and the growth <coughs> success to help people understand this, the, the purpose of e-cigarettes and to help people understand how our young people are influenced by e-cigarettes, by marijuana, and also by the traditional aspects of seeing adults in our society. Thank you. Good morning to you all. And uh, I want to say what Van Ois said came in. It's great that we're all here today to talk about a really critical issue that hasn't gotten the kind of attention that it should. So this is an interesting time. Um, as Fran told you, we're at an all-time low for smoking. Fifty years ago, the Surgeon General issued this report, which really changed the whole ballpark. And Fifty years later, we're saying, boy, the glass is half full. We're modern lows of smoking rates, and yet the glass is half empty because there's so much more that we can do. So I'm going to go through some of those things. I'm going to do something that I never do in these kinds of talks because I was asked to do it, which is to tell a little bit about the work of our center. The Smoking Sedition Leadership Center generally works through others, and we want them to take the credit, but I've been specifically tasked in this talk and subsequent panel to really talk about us. But in talking about us, I'm going to talk about our, our partners too. So uh, this happened 50 years ago. 
Uh, earlier this year, the uh, JAMA put together a theme issue on all the things that have happened since the report of the Surgeon General. And you can see since they put together a cover to really talk about things uh, and show some of the icons. Uh, Luther Terry is the gentleman on the far right at the top. Uh, the woman at the bottom is a woman who was featured in the FDA ads for smoking. Um, but you can see that um, a lot of things have happened and uh, it's a celebratory time. And I'm sure you all saw this, that CBS Pharmacy stops selling cigarettes. And I'm proud to say that I said it was a small part of having that happen too. So I want to talk about, uh, in the next few, few minutes, let's go over a little bit of our history, um, do a summary of the stuff that you probably know, talk about our partnerships in the media health area, so epidemiologic facts and next steps. When I uh, went to become the president of the Robert Johnson Foundation in 1990, I was astonished to know that none of the large health foundations, and only one of the small ones, even were interested in tobacco. Even though tobacco then and now was a number one killer. And why was that? I never quite figured it out, but my thoughts are A, smoking is so stigmatized, B, the boards of those foundations tend to be upper middle class people whose lives weren't touched by smoking much. And C, they were really worried about what the tobacco industry was going to do in retribution because the tobacco industry plays really, really well. Um, so it was a bit of a struggle to get Robert Johnson to take this on, but it ultimately did. It. And ultimately, it's very conservative, business oriented board became proud of these programs. And over the 12 and a half years that I was there, we made grants of $500 million in this field. Um, and when Joel Fleischman wrote a book, The Foundation, which was published in 2007, he credited our programs with being one of the 12 most impactful programs of, of any foundations in the last 100 years. Um, and uh, so that shows you that you can make progress. Uh, the foundation is not doing as much in tobacco as it used to, and no other big foundation stepped into that void except for the Port Wealthy Legacy Foundation, which was mandated to do it by the involvement uh, of the creation. So when I left Robert Johnson to come back to UCSF, I was given the opportunity to create a program and decided that it would be the Smoke Cessation Leadership Center. The attempt being to narrow the big gap between what we know clinicians and agencies ought to do about smoking and what they ought to do. Um, we knew the data on smoking and be behavioral health, but when we called around and talked to the experts in the field, they said, don't go there. It's a waste of time. People with a, with a mental health and substance use condition are interested in quitting. The clinicians don't want to. There are other, prior, there are other major efforts and besides it's their own pleasure. So we said, well, these are the experts, you know, you've got to do what they say. So we stayed away from it, but it bothered us. It really bothered us because we are missing a big opportunity. So finally, when the Legacy Foundation said, we'd like you to work with us also, uh, we said, well, can we do it in this field? They said, yes. Uh, and so that got us started. Um, we do our work at SCLC by I, identifying existing champions. And I'm going to uh, give you a slide, sort of naming some of those, uh, not all of them. Um, and then we want to amplify their voices. So we didn't, we're not the first people in this field, but we have the capability of finding the champions and helping them do their work. We do TA, we work with federal, with all the federal and state agencies like SAMHSA. We have the ability to give small grants, and we do educational offerings. I think we've done 42 webinars now conferences, we write articles, we have a website. Uh, our style, I think, is we value being flexible and customer service. Um, and I'd like to ask the SCLC staff in the back of the room that it's a stand up because they embody customer service. So thank you for all of you.
fast, not smoking and alcohol. As you heard, almost 500,000 deaths per year in the United States, and about 5 million worldwide. And if current trends keep going, particularly if in the developing world smoking increases, there will be uh, almost uh, there will be more than 8 million deaths by 2030. Of those 480,000 deaths, 42,000 are from exposure to secondhand smoke and by non smokers. And in addition to all those deaths, there are over 16 million people, according to the Surgeon General's report of 2014, who are walking around or trying to walk around with illnesses caused by their smoking, like COPD, like lung cancer, like heart disease, like strokes. Um, we've got over 40 million daily smokers, smokers in the United States today. One of the trends has been that fewer of them are daily smokers, um, and the amount of cigarettes per day is down to about 14.6. So smoking is the leading preventable cause of death. This is a slide that lists the other behaviorally linked causes of death, and it's not even close. There was a time when people thought that the combination of being obese and not active physically was going to overtake smoking, but it was shown that, that there was a, an estimation error that was wrong. All these are important to be sure, but smoking just dominates. And this is a slide that I update periodically, and I love it because, uh, and in the yellow, you can see the stuff that I've added in the last year or two. And every year we find new scientific data to show that smoking increases the odds of getting these things. One of the most recent is Alzheimer's. And think of the motivation that you can say to your smokers and your family, if you keep smoking, you're going to have a higher risk of Alzheimer's. And we're going to have an SCLC webinar on Alzheimer's and smoking in June, what, Christine? 25th. June 26th. So I think it's going to be popular. It's a terrific motivational issue, and it's something that's recently just come onto the stage. Probably acts, uh, acts through vascular uh, by, uh, by making it uh, more likely to get cerebrovascular disease. Now, sometimes you'll deal with older clients who are smokers, and they say, isn't the horse out of the barn? The answer is no. So this is, in that, uh, this is an article in the NHAM last year showing that if you quit at various ages, you save a lot of life. And even in the 65 and older, there are a lot of smokers over age 65 for two reasons. Either they quit or they die. Uh, but even they will save lives. So uh, a, terrific mo a terrific way to kind of motivate smokers that it's never too late to quit. Uh, we heard from our first two speakers the heavy burden that smoking exerts on people with mental illness and substance use disorders. Um, 200,000 of those 480,000 annual deaths, we estimate, occurs in this population. They consume 40% of all cigarettes sold in the United States. They have a higher rate of smoking. When they smoke, they smoke more cigarettes daily. And also, if you go outside an AA shelter, you'll see they smoke them right down to the butt. All you see them butt. Some of the panhandlers you see are not panhandling for drugs or food or clothes. They're panhandling for cigarettes. People with chronic mental illness die a lot earlier than people who don't. Uh, what they die from are smoking-linked illnesses, COPD, um, lung cancer, heart disease, stroke. And so it's not homicide, it's not suicide, it's the smoking that makes them die. Compound that with the impedance to getting into wellness. If you smell like cigarettes, if your fingernails are yellow, if your, if your clothes smell bad, it's going to be harder for you to sit next to somebody on a bus, to apply for a job. Um, so a tremendous burden that smoking causes on this population. Now, in that theme issue of JAMA, a couple of studies talked about how much we benefited from all the tobacco control efforts that the government and the states have done over the years. There were, in that period, almost 18 million deaths from smoking. But had there not been the, the, all the strategies that have been put into place, there would have been an extra 8 million people who would have died. And of all the tremendous health gains between 1964 and today, and we really are, in spite of all that you read and HIV and everything else, we are a much healthier nation. 
30% of life expectancy gains over the last 50 years were only due to smoking. Incredible, incredible thing. Um, and yet, as the Cook article points out, people with mental illness did not benefit nearly as much from those declines in smoking rates. So, beginning in 2007, we entered this field cautiously. Because everybody said, you're foolish, don't do it. Um, but we did anyhow. And I want to salute some individual people, because what we found were there were, we weren't the first to get involved in this field. And there are a lot of pioneers out there doing it, but their organizations didn't join them. So they were lonely pioneers, and there's just only some of them on this slide. Uh, Bob Lover, Joe Parks, and Nashville, Doug Sedonis, and Jill Williams, who you're going to hear from in the psychiatric world. Chad Morris, who you're going to hear from. Uh, Sharon Hall, and Jody Prochaska, uh, they're both at UCSF, Jody's now at Stanford. Daryl Sharp, a psychiatric nurse at Rochester, and others, some who are in this room. So they were doing it, but people weren't listening as much as they should. And so we made our early contacts, uh, including two major agencies, NAMI and SAMHSA. Uh, and I'm very uh, grateful to Gail Hutchings, uh, who was former deputy director at uh, SAMHSA, who introduced us to people, because this was not a role that I knew very well, and Terry Klein, who ran the agency part of AMI, who listened and to their credit said, you know, we're not doing as much as we should, and we should do more. Um, and when I went around, when we went around and talked to these groups, there were two key arguments that held today. One is a tremendous health toll, and second is the second hand smoke. And so a lot of people say, well, the poor old Uncle Joe, he's got chronic schizophrenia, smoking is his only pleasure, why take it from him? And the answers are twofold. One is because he's got a real chance of dying early and having a horrible death. And two, when little Timmy comes to visit him and he's smoking, you're going to make Timmy sick. Uh, and so those are, those are very powerful arguments. So we had a summit uh, in Lansdowne where we, this was an historic summit, I do believe. Uh, we brought together the leaders of major organizations to see if we can start a movement. And that movement actually happened, and you all are a part of it. And it's so gratifying to be in a movement where the cause is so righteous. Uh, I was not able to be a part of the civil rights movement, although I was cheering it on, and other movements. But this is, I don't want to say it's better than that, but it's similar in that it's grassroots, and it's looking at issues that are very clear cut, where there's a right and a wrong, and trying to make that, 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 that kind of a difference. So our goals were to raise consciousness of this issue and to normalize smoking cessation as part of essential behavioral health treatment. Um, and our core strategies were to reach out to key stakeholders, to develop data, to provide education, to promote provider-driven uh, education, to promote staff wellness and, and smoking cessation. So uh, in the behavioral health field, a lot of the clinicians themselves smoke, a lot of them were formerly users in recovery, got rid of all the habits except for, for their smoking. Uh, and so try to help them stop and strengthen the use of quit lines. Um, so this is a growing list of the partners. These are some of the, or these are the organizations who were at that meeting and then others said, can we join? So this, I won't read all these, but the important thing is, it became apparent that this was a movement worth joining. And a lot of people joined. Now, the definition of joining varied. Some really waded in, and some said, okay, we think it's good, but we've got other priorities. Um, but it's wonderful to work with them all. And we've been able to give small grants, and these are some of the groups that have gotten those grants. Let me just single out CAPTA. CADCA was an organization that Robert Johnson started a long time ago to help communities deal with substance abuse issues. And they had never taken on smoking. And when we talked to them, they said, you know, something we should do. And they are now successful recipients of grants in this field and using their organizational power to do it. And when we threw all these, uh, the NAMI story was a fascinating one. And they have really changed. When they come back, I think I chose now. So, what
what has been what's been some of the progress you've made? Well, the ASHPID, what a horrible acronym, but what a great group. <laughs> they developed this toolkit, which all of you can have, uh, and it, spe it featured smoking cessation uh, in its national meetings um, and promoted the quit the quit card number and, and the quit number. And they promoted psychiatric hospitals going smoke free. And this is an amazing progress. Because the argument used to be, oh my gosh, if you take away cigarettes, uh, the, the uh, clients there are going to riot, it's going to be much worse. It turns out that wasn't true. And actually, things got better in those hospitals. Uh, and staff are now smoking less. And I think it's going to be only a couple of years before all these institutions will be totally smoke free. So that's, you don't see progress at this rate often in healthcare. Um, Fran mentioned our work with SAMHSA. We created a tobacco-free program, starting with uh, an in-service for the SAMHSA staff in Washington, giving in-kind TA to the grantees and states, uh, and helping to make, as I was gratified to see in that slide, that smoking cessation and stopping young people from quitting trying to prevent young people from starting smoking is a core strategy. <coughs> so let me talk about a couple of the programs we did with SAMHSA. One is to coordinate their 100 pioneers for smoking cessation. And that was in 2009. Um, and this involved giving a very, very small grant, $1,000, to the clinics that were taking care of people with mental illness or substance use disorders so that they could do more on smoking cessation. Uh, and so we got almost 100 different clinics to say, we want to do this. Probably cost more than $1,000 to write the application and go against it, but they said, we want the recognition. Uh, and then they've been involved in webinars and TA with us. Uh, and as a result of those, we did a follow-up that those clinics raise their rate of intervention with smokers from 20% to 50%. So again, glass filling up, but more than could be done. And then there was a phase two, where we gave 25 million states an extra, again, very small grant, 2,000 grant, to expand their program. And the key there was not the creation of new programs, but the finding people who were already doing it and wanted to do more. Then our next phase of the collaboration with SAMHSA was to create academies where SAMHSA provided the support for leaders to get together in the first seven of those states. You might be surprised, Oklahoma, North Carolina, Texas, Arkansas. Yeah, there are amazing people in state agencies there who said, we understand this problem, we want to do more. So we put together a one and a half day summit we got all the different agencies involved in tobacco, the, uh, the alcohol agencies, the mental health agencies, the state quit line, the tobacco agencies, and some of the states, I'm sorry to say, they never met each other. And we got them in the same room and got them to come up with the common goal of how much they're going to lower smoking rates in their populations, and then to conceive a set of strategies that they thought would work that they wanted to work on. And then over the months following that, to do TA calls with them, to help them. Um, and um, would you believe Mississippi, the state that's normally the last on the health rankings, came to us and said, you know, SAMHSA stopped funding this, but we want to do it on our own. Would you come and help us? Uh, and we've got a lot of other calls from other states saying, how can we do this? So a chance for agencies to collaborate, they're all really busy, there's heavy turnover, but working together for this goal. And this is a map showing uh, the 100 pioneers and the uh, eight state agencies. Um, and it's really terrific. And we summarize all our work with SAMHSA to date in an article that's come out in the American Journal of Public Health just this month. And I'm proud to say that Dr. Berlin is a co-author on that. Uh, and it really shows what a collaborative agency so let's talk about NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, I went and made a call to the leadership of NAMI in 2007, just before our summit. Uh, there was the CEO and the head lawyer, uh, Ken Duckworth, the chief medical officer, of course, wasn't there. But when 
But I walked in the <coughs> and I explained. I said, we're going to start this movement, and now he's so powerful that we can kill him if you want. And they looked at each other and they sighed. They said, we knew this day was going to come. Our membership is so conflicted on this subject. We're so conflicted. Um, I'll tell you what. We won't support it, but we won't kill it. I said, that's all I'm going to ask. They came to the meeting. They didn't say much there, you know, the, the posture with the arms crossed and the legs crossed. And what are you trying to do to us? Um, and then um, they said a little later, you know, we do a bullet, we do a video called Hearts and Minds. And Hearts and Minds is addressing the issue that people with mental illness, because of the drugs they take and not being active, uh, have a higher rate of being overweight and die earlier from heart disease. So they said, we want to modernize our 1999 video of Hearts and Minds. Can you help us with that? Can you give us a moment? I said, yes, under one condition. Uh, you got to put smoking in it. And Ken Duckworth said, thank you. He said, I tried to do that in 1999, and leadership wouldn't let me. So the updated version, which I think came out in 2010, the first scene is a psychiatrist from Boston, from Harvard, saying the most important thing people with mental can do is to stop smoking. So again, a real culture shift. I told you about Catechism. Um, <coughs> they did a survey of their membership, and to their astonishment, you know, these are communities that are being ravaged with drug use, and alcohol, and, and you know, crime. And yet, in a membership, in a survey, the third most uh, important priority was smoking. And they found that 59% of the coalitions were doing it, coming directly, and others weren't. And so we've been working on a network and a set of strategy uh, to help CACA integrate as SAMHSA's doing smoking cessation into its family. Um, one of the things we found when we work with groups is that they're not all ready to become experts on smoking, which uh, more should be, but not all are. And some of them say, if you're asking us to be experts, we don't think we can do that. So we have a plan B which is to use the telephone quit line. And I've got my uh, quit card uh, on my uh, on suit here, and I've got my EIS tie from the CDC, so I'm a poster like one of these tennis players with my <laughs> <laughs> um, And so we've uh, been trying to work with them, with uh, people in uh, this area, to get the quit lines to um, feature smoking cessation, uh, to, get, to get these organizations to use the telephone quit line. And the telephone quit lines will worry, well, how do we handle this population? So Chad Morris, as I'm sure he's going to tell you later, actually worked with a big group trying to figure out how the intake could help in this field. Uh, American psychiatric nurses made a major issue, uh, and I'm going to show you that. Open this out. A major issue of their journal, solely devoted to smoking, and they adopted a policy statement that all nurses working with behavioral health populations should demonstrate smoking cessation companies, co competencies, interview in the practice settings, and act to change attitudes and institutional and organizational barriers to improve cessation. Take action at the state level advocate for policy changes, expand smoke cessation ed education, increase each year by 5% the number of psychiatric nurses who are smokers of treatment, and the number who provide cessation best practices. But no other behavioral health organization has followed suit to date. We have given up. So this is where we'd like to be. We've gone from 42% smoking rates to 18% by 2012, 2024, 20, public health services, let's get to 10%. We'd love to get lower than that. We want to accelerate this. Uh, federal agencies now acknowledge um, this population in smoke cessation efforts where they didn't only five or six years ago, um, which is amazing. Um, so what's our vision? Our vision for smoking and behavioral health is that all organizations representing Clinicians who work in this field 
and their consumers designating smoking cessation as the highest priority. That all clinicians in behavioral health directly intervene or refer to an appropriate resource like a clinic in their setting, like Kaiser can do, or a telephone equipment. That all relevant federal, state, and local governmental organizations ensure access to smoking cessation for people with a behavioral health issue. They assure smoke-free grounds and a non-smoking staff. People in this room can help to make that happen. And I salute your efforts. Some of you were pioneers way before this was a part of the movement. It is now a movement, and let's help to make it stronger so we can make our population healthy. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to kind of just do a really brief summary before we have time for a few questions. Um, one, it's a movement worth joining. A movement worth joining. So, kind of, if you don't take away another thing, the tobacco cessation movement in the end of the is a movement worth joining. Fran's uh, key point of prevention is key. Um, communities need to be involved. Uh, when I was listening to that friend, I thought about how many of you live in communities where you have a small corner store? One thing you can do is make sure that that corner store is not selling tobacco products to kids. A lot of kids get their cigarettes and e cigs from the corner stores. And finally, uh, Steve's uh, summary, not only is the movement we're joining, but we need to normalize tobacco cessation as a part of behavioral health treatment and prevention. Normalize tobacco cessation as a part of the health. So, um, as I said earlier, we have left a few minutes um, for questions um, and uh, comments. Anything that you want these two individuals who are um, in positions that they can make change and make something happen. Um, any questions, comments, what thoughts? Have a question here. Here you go. There are mics in the very much for your comments this morning. Um, I work for a private consultancy in the Northwest and have been working on tobacco control and tobacco public policy, among other things, for many years. Recently, clients have come to me uh, wanting to work on uh, smoke-free town or downtown areas, uh, which I'm, I'm highly in support of because I really believe in the denormalization of tobacco. However, when we scratch the surface slightly, we realize that some of the people who are interested in this issue may be using it as a way to rid, or they believe it will rid the downtown area of people experiencing homelessness. And my firm won't work on the issues unless the client expresses a commitment to uh, work with populations experiencing homelessness in order to help them with their nicotine addiction. So then they come back to us and say, okay, let's do that. <laughs> and then we go, okay, um, we've done a pretty thorough search, but we're very interested in any, and really from anyone, <laughs> not now, but you can contact me later, from anyone who has successfully uh, entered into this area of cessation and prevention. Uh, we understand the rates are very high. Uh, we understand this is a very, very, uh, vulnerable and difficult population to work with. So uh, that's my question for either one of you. So there are two physicians who are specifically interested in smoking in the homeless. Uh, one is a guy named Travis Baggett from Mass General Hospital, and one is a woman named Maya Bajarikan. I can't remember her, how to pronounce her last name. It's a very long last name with about 15 syllables. But <laughs> she's in the faculty at UC San Diego contact us, uh, we can provide linkages to them. They're really wonderful physicians. You'd be so proud to know them. They understand this population. It turns out that many of the homeless would like to stop smoking. And a tremendous amount of their very limited income is going there. So it should be an either or. You should make the downtown smoke free and you should try to help this population. Thank you for caring about that issue. Yeah. Steve, can, um, can uh, the speaker maybe they ask a the question? Yes. To get that information. So, uh, yeah, uh, but there they are. 
Hi, my name is Donna, and it's a comment on for Fran. Um, you mentioned earlier the notion of culture, and I think that's very important. I work in a state where um, alcohol and other drug substance abuse, etc., the name changes um, occasionally, but they came to us a few years ago and said, we're supposed to put the T back in AODT, right? And so we had those quiet meetings and all, and it's over, we're done, we haven't met again. And there's so much that can be done from policy to brief interventions, and certainly even conversing around some of the pros and cons around quit lines and treating people with uh, persistent uh, mental health disorders. But that culture thing is something that we need, I think, help from your level down to the state level and bringing, I guess, I mean, it starts with, you know, local, I get that, but we also need the support, because when we heard bring the tea back, it was like, rah, 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 and it's gone, you know? And meanwhile, we sit on the other side of the river, and we're, we're anxious to partner and help people think through around policy, staff policy, um, facility policy. We have a decent relationship with our commissioner of health, and as do they, but I think we could be so much stronger if we came together, and I think you brought up suddenly we're so on point with the notion of culture. Okay. Um, so I had a, just, as I walked in the room this morning, I wondered who I would see and what, you know, would it be mostly behavior health people here or tobacco control? So I, I'm still interested in that. It's not clear to me who the, you know, for sure who all the players are, and it's great, it's a, it's a great mixture. What I didn't hear you talking about was the call to action to the tobacco control. Because um, until lately, uh, we've been celebrating all our trifecta of, you know, our big model is smoke-free air, funding, and tax. And to show how the numbers have gone down, except no one kind of pointed our nose in tobacco control to who we've left behind. And that's the folks with mental health issues. And we're really not, it's, it's you know, it's starting to glisten, but it's not in our as I see as been in tobacco control a long time. It's not even listed as a priority population. You know, we're funding populations that have much lower levels, and when you get designated a priority population, you get notice and that's called funding to address these issues. I'm not sure we have the models. I'm still skeptical about a quit line as the way to help people with mental health issues. I really am. If they were I think we, I don't know, I still the question in my mind is out on that. Um, and when I saw your list of who attended the summit, what I didn't see were the tobacco control folks that, again, need to have some attention focused on this priority population that's using 40% of tobacco, and yet tobacco control, we're, we're just starting to talk about it, I'm not saying not at all, but it's not at the rate we should be, and saying the trifecta hasn't impacted this population the way it has the general population. So I don't think it's behavior health or tobacco control. It's both and, and not either or. And I really ha um, have to express my appreciation to Dr. Jill Williams. I've worked with her the last two years, and I can't tell you how impactful it has been, both for our tobacco control communities in Minnesota and North Dakota particularly, and behavior health folks, literally hundreds of them sit in an audience like this and say they've never heard a tobacco <coughs> session in their professional career. So, thoughts and ideas. So I, I will make three comments. One is that's a glass half empty comment, and the glass is half empty. I'm glad to say that. You're absolutely right. Um, the Legacy Foundation and its party populations initially didn't have BH population in, and, and Karen, I think about seven or eight years ago, it had it. So um, it's now a part of other organizations who do the, the same thing. Um, people like uh, Jill, Jody Pachowska, and others have shown that the model for treatment is not that different for this population and others. It's just they're starting at a higher level. And it's interesting that even those who continue to smoke are smoking fewer cigarettes than they used to. So the standard trifecta is working in this population too. It's just working slower. And I agree with your impatience and urgency, and I hope that organizations and meetings like this can make things better because to do nothing is to kill people.
And I would just add thank you and continue to bring this up um, time and time again. I was looking for you to talk it. Um, when SAMHSA has been working with their federal partners to bring this uh, conversation on focusing on behavioral health and tobacco use for the last few years. Uh, Dr. Coe, Howard Coe, who's the Assistant Secretary for Health, really brought it alive uh, in the last two years um, by bringing um, up the, the attention, once he learned the statistics, of how, how, how many of our people that are really struggling, you can even imagine what it must be like to be struggling with an addiction or struggling with a mental illness, get to a point in your life where you think that you are in an area of recovery just to find out that you have been slowly killing yourself with an, another addiction that has been overlooked. So we're, I agree with Dr. Schroeder, we are in the process and I hope that you will see and voices are, as yours will continue to push federal government, state government, local government into doing more to the attention of this. And if I just say one of the memorable conversations I've had with drug use treatment uh, people is I'm tired of getting people sober and then having them die of all cancer. I'm very glad that uh, two topics have been brought up, obviously, the mental health issue, which is prominent for those of us who are uh, mental health providers like myself, um, and also the issue of e-cigarettes, which is also very much on my mind. My question is, uh, there, there are some people in the mental health field who are talking about e-cigarettes as a harm reduction tool, especially with mentally ill uh, individuals. And so, uh, I guess my question is, what thoughts do you have about that, and what if any research is there on use of e-cigarettes as a, essentially a harm reduction uh, technique. <clears throat> to be honest with you, probably Doug Tipperman knows more about this than I do, but the um, agencies that are, we're learning from in SAMHSA uh, are the FDA and the CDC. Um, they are, um, are doing a lot of research into e-cigarettes. SAMHSA is learning as they're teaching. Uh, in this area, and we're doing the research on um, the use rates. Uh, the issue is, uh, from a prevention perspective, what, which I'm much more familiar with, uh, is the attractiveness, and, and with everything that comes out, you're, you're getting the first message, and we haven't gotten down to the real messages of what, um, you know, what the, the danger levels of e-cigarettes, and the two different types of e-cigarettes, and all the different ways that you can add flavors, but no matter how many flavors that you're adding, the nicotine is still there. And that's the piece that hasn't come out. And so I would yield this one to my colleague on the podium, but also um, to FDA and the CDC. So I get to ask this question all the time, both in a professional and at a cocktail party. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my answer is, do you want to hear the good or the bad? So the good scenario is, if all the 43 million cigarette smokers switch to e-cigarette, no question in my mind, we would have a healthier country. That's the good news. The bad news is, we don't know how, how harmful they are. They're clearly not as harmful as what you said, but they're not harmful. Second is, we don't know if they're a cessation bridge, or just a way for people to smoke when they can't smoke in, in public. Third, one of the things most really concerning they're so the, the marketing right now is predatory, and they're so seductive. And so will they encourage people who wouldn't have used an e-cigarette to start on them, and then to have a gateway to smoking, even just to, to do that, will they be a deterrence to people who want to stop smoking? And so the policy, uh, the recommendations I have are, A, regulate the advertising. Don't let them self-promote as a cessation uh, guide unless we can prove that that's so. And don't let them put all these uh, flavors and stuff in. But the data are all in, and hopefully we'll find out about it. It's amazing, though, how much press they've got. <clears throat> what a commercial opportunity it is. So, to, to the gentleman asked the question, our closing plenary, our closing plenary panel tomorrow is um, a researcher who's done some research in E6, and um, a gentleman from. Uh, um, uh, California, who's also going to talk about you know the policy perspective. So 
We're excited about that posing posing challenge. Thank you very much again to our opening speakers, um, and we're going to break.